I've called this talk, When Trouble Comes Our Way, which is actually what Tracy was talking about. When trouble comes our way, we stand on who God is and what he has promised us, because he never changes. When trouble comes our way, Job 2 verse 10. Shall we accept only good at God's hand? Shall we not also accept misfortune? My mum hopes you won't walk out halfway through this talk. <coughs> she thinks it's a tough message. <laughs> Just warning you. This talk first took root when Martin spoke on Count It All Joy more than a year ago. And you may remember him laid flat on his back and all of us thinking, what's happening? And Martin and Sue thinking, what's happening? And you, you, gave, you counted your blessings at the end of every day. And I think that is a remarkable testimony. <laughs> what I have to say also echoes what a lot of people shared last week when Artemon shared so movingly about when he was really ill and the thoughts that went through his mind and who was he holding on to in all of that uncertainty and fear, really, God. He was holding on to God and God's promises. His whole family were. And especially when Lynn shared the recent experiences of her learning journey with God. So I want to talk today about the link between encountering difficulties and then seeing growth in our spiritual lives. Firstly, we'll look at three possible reasons for why God allows us to go through hard times. And then secondly, we'll explore how God helps us to grow more like Jesus in these experiences. Sorry, when I'm anxious, I get a little bit breathy at the still, so I'm doing my best to do my breathing exercises. So firstly, why does God allow us to go through hard times? The short answer is because he is in charge and he has a plan. There is purpose in all he does. I write the following verse in the front of every new diary I buy. Job 37 verse 13. Whether for correction, or for his land, or for love, he, that is God, causes it to happen. Whether for correction, or for his land, or for love, he causes it to happen. So firstly, for correction, I think a kinder word for this is training. In James 1 verses 2 to 4, it says, Count it all joy, my brethren, when you meet various trials, so that you may become mature. In other words, think of it as an opportunity for joy when you're in difficult circumstances, because this is a chance for you to grow as a person. God the gardener might want to prune us like a tree so that we can produce more fruit. God the teacher may be training us out of bad habits in our bodies, or our minds, or our spirits, so we don't have to keep making the same mistakes. Then we can become the best version of ourselves. This means little and often. Daily practice. Tracy doesn't just decide to run 53k for her 53rd birthday and then magically be gifted with the ability. She is out in all weathers, training her body for strength and endurance. Is it pleasant, Trace, when it's freezing cold and pouring with rain? <laughs> a coffee at the end. There's a room. Jeff King, the spiritual gardener, has often, uh, has often talked about growing things, but once I remember he talked about growing trees. And when the saplings are young and vulnerable, they often have a protective cage or a stake to help them grow straight and to keep out the hungry deer and rabbits. But later, this has to be removed to encourage mature growth. And he said to me, Buffeting by the wind produces strong roots. Let me say that again. Buffeting by the wind produces strong roots. The second reason why God might allow us to go through difficult times is for his land. In other words, for the kingdom of God. 
God, <clears throat> God has plans for his kingdom to cover the earth, to fill it with people who find their fulfilment in him. A place without suffering or sorrow of de or death of any kind, where we really are one big happy family. God won't have to call, where are you? Because we will all be with him all the time. He had to call that in the Garden of Eden because we separated ourselves from him. But in the kingdom, we are with him all the time and he doesn't have to say, where are you? Because we're with him. To extend his kingdom, God needs people to extend his glory. Those who reflect his glory, who carry his message and who are a force for good. We need to change and we've already heard about that this morning from Morris. If we don't embrace change, something sleeps. Something is dormant within us. We need to change. As Jeff Langston said last week, we need to be listening for his still, small voice, ready and alert to what he is doing. The third reason that God might let us go through difficult times is because he loves us, for love. God's love nurtures and protects us. When we meet opposition and trials, is it our default setting to see it as life or the devil out to get us? Sometimes we do need to engage in spiritual warfare, but oftentimes opposition is training not spiritual attack. God watches over us and he is a good father who gives good gifts. Maybe we just need to learn how to use them. He has, <coughs> sorry. He has ransacked heaven for us. He has turned upside down the natural order <coughs> to rescue us. He has broken laws of sin and death and punishment and established new ones of grace and forgiveness so that we can all be included. He has ransacked heaven for us. He continues to speak and provide and lead and inspire in all our human inconsistency, inadequacy and failure he carries us in all our joys, success and triumph. He dances with us. God has a plan for us as individuals, for his kingdom and for a broken world. So how does encountering challenge help us to become more like Jesus? This is one of Paul, my, my exes, a dear friend. This is one of his favorite phrases. In 1978, the educator Vygotsky put forward a theory which showed how people take on new skills. He suggested that to learn, a person needs to move out of their comfort zone. He called the transition from the known and comfortable to the unknown, the zone of proximal development. Paul loves that phrase. It's become a byword in our family. It just means that training goes through three stages. It starts with a skilled person, such as a teacher or a parent, who says, watch me, this is how it's done. Secondly, the second stage is when the teacher gives direct instruction for the pupil to follow. Listen to me, I will help you. And then the third stage is finally the teacher or parent steps back and encourages independence in a good way, in a strength, personal strength, taking responsibility for ourselves. Now, you do it yourself, you're doing great. I'm here if you need me. We can see how Jesus did this with Peter through three stories 
in the New Testament in the Bible. Martin called it once, being prepared to stick your neck out of your shell like a tortoise does. If he doesn't stick his neck out, he's going nowhere. In Matthew 8, Jesus says, let us go across the lake to the other side, so God has a plan. He's quite at peace about it and falls asleep in the boat. Then comes a terrifying storm which tests the disciples resolve. They have a choice to trust or to panic. They panic mm -hmm. until Jesus calms the storm and the boat carries on just as he had planned. And he's teaching them, watch me, this is how it's done. In Matthew 14, the disciples are again in a boat in a storm, and this time Jesus is not in the boat with them. He's on the shore watching. As soon as he sees they're in trouble, he walks out on the water to lend a hand. Peter sees Jesus. Again, Jesus is miraculously controlling the elements, and he wants to have a go. Jesus says, all right, come on then. Peter tries and sinks and needs to be rescued by Jesus. But Jesus is saying, listen to me. He said, come on, have a go. I will help you. The third stage in this development of Peter's experiences with God is in Acts 2 at Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit arrives in overwhelming power. And in Jerusalem, the disciples find themselves surrounded by a storm of criticism and confusion. They're being accused of all sorts of things. People are misunderstanding their motives. They're in the middle of a storm. Peter takes the lead. He explains what God is doing and he invites people to join in. And about 3,000 people take up his challenge to follow <coughs> Jesus and trust him in their lives. I'm sure Jesus was up in heaven at this point, beaming, you're doing great! I'm here if you need me. In my experience, I find I have learned the most and seen the most radical change in myself when I'm journeying through storms, not when I'm paddling in calm waters. Reliance on him becomes imperative. It is a daily choice to take on the challenges that come our way and to see them as stepping stones and not stumbling blocks. It is week 100 since I first caught COVID. I now think of BC as before COVID. <laughs> Partway through the first year, I, 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 I was getting a bit desperate, and that was in the first year. I asked God, why are you doing this? And he said, now you know what it feels like to be the people you're trying to reach. You are one of them. Broken, disenfranchised, wondering whether the money was going to last, not knowing what each day was going to bring, how I was going to feel when I got up, not knowing if I would ever be able to work again, although I just That is a miracle. For me, that is a miracle in so many ways. Those of you who know me know that. Um, all of those things, the fact that you can get up and start a day and then just think, this whole day has got away from me and I can't do anything. And the more I am with the people that I'm with in Pagan Hill, the more I know how it feels from the inside to be in that situation. So God is good. And when I first went to Pagan Hill, I went there with a bit like, God sent me on a mission and I'm here to do good. <laughs> now it's like, I'm just here being along with you. <laughs> if any person would come after me, let them deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. That's from Luke 9 verse 23. If we want to develop a more Christ-like character, there are no shortcuts. Discipleship, which simply means learning to be like Jesus, 
means imitating him. A Christ-like character includes all nine of the fruits of the Spirit, found in Galatians 5, which again was mentioned last week. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Since God certainly wants to develop these characteristics in us, either for correction, or for his kingdom, or for love, he will give us the opportunities to exercise and practice these gifts. Thank you, Lynn, for showing us last week how Jesus has been discipling you. I can't even see her today. Thank you, and that was really meaningful to me when you shared last week about the process that God is taking you through. As we exercise, our spiritual muscles will hurt. It requires determination when God puts us in difficult situations, often opposite to our expectations, to train us. The challenges we face are not a mistake or a punishment and should not be a surprise. <coughs> they are part of God's plan for our development. For example, if we want to grow in love, we may find that God gives us people who are difficult to love. The curmudgeonly, prickly and outcast, the annoying or smelly, the demanding, foolish and oversensitive people, often those who are just like us. <laughs> then we learn that God loves us eternally and conditionally, unconditionally, and we can share his love with others. If we want to grow in patience, we may notice that people let us down or prayers may seem to take decades to answer. God is stretching us like elastic, making us more resilient. He is also reminding us that he needs infinite patience with us. His silly sheep who keep wandering off the sensible and well signposted pathway. Then we learn that God is committed to us and we can share his patience with others. If we want to grow in goodness, we must do so regardless of the world's morality, regardless of the choices and enticements around us, whether it be to steal time and paper clips from our place of work, or to engage in morally dubious activities. God holds us to a different standard, unswayed by the criticism, what makes you so special? Jesus was able to challenge injustice in society and yet befriend the individuals who made wrong life choices. Then we learn that God is holy and just and true and we can share his goodness with others. If we want to grow in self-control, it is last on the list, as Lynn said, possibly because it's the hardest. Here is an opportunity to unlearn selfishness by putting others first, even when we're irritated, angry, disappointed or tired. How will we choose to respond? Will we turn to God's spirit within us or rely on our human resources? Are we willing like Jesus to say, not my will but yours, O oh God, show me the way, help me to walk in it, teach me, Lord. Then we learn that all we need is in God, and we can share his self-control with others. I had a lot of fun trying to foresee how God might choose to grow these nine character qualities <coughs> in me. It's something you might like to try and think about for yourself. In summary then, we thank God in difficult circumstances because we know he has a plan. And this is a chance for us to grow as a person to daily take up our cross and learn from Jesus, to become his disciples. We end with encouragement from St Paul, who wrote in Romans 5, let us be full of joy and triumph in our troubles, knowing that pressure produces patient endurance and endurance develops character and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen.